A warm welcome to all our viewers who've clicked into this broadcast session. Uh, it's a format for Q&A we're calling I'll Ask and Answer. It's the first of its kind. Uh, it's brought to you both uh, uh, by the uh, Isle of Wight County Chamber of Commerce as a public service and uh, the Isle of Wight Economic Development Department. And I'm the director, Chris Morello, and I'm going to be playing a relatively minor role uh, starting off this by introducing our co-host, Jessica Healy. She's president of the Isle of Wight Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. uh, good morning to you, Jessica. Good morning, Chris. Thank you so much for uh, having me. And I'm very excited to be here today and collaborate on our first I'll Ask and Answer, um, one of many to come. So we're going to we're going to go ahead and get started. We have a special guest with us today, Jim Carroll. Just do want to do a, a quick introduction for those of you who might not know of Jim. Um, he is a retired Naval officer of 21 years and received his MBA from the Cass Business School of the City University of London. He has been executive director of the Small Business Development Center since 1997. And under his leadership, the center was recognized twice as the top center in the Commonwealth. Uh, the Small Business Development Center provides free one-on-one -on -one counseling for small businesses in the 18 cities and counties of Hampton Roads, the Middle Peninsula, and the Eastern Shore of Virginia. And if you are involved with the chamber, you will see him here in our office once a month doing those one-on-one -on -one consultations. Um, so thank you so much, Jim, for being here with us today. Well, thank you very much, Jessica. It's great to be with you guys. All right, so this is gonna be a Q&A format um, and we're just gonna jump right on into our first question. So uh, we are hearing you know, a lot from local businesses that have applied um, you know, for the EIDL loan through SBA um, or the PVP loans um, as quickly as they had expected, even as uh, two weeks, but they're not hearing back yet. So they're, they're applying, but they're not hearing um, back as quickly as they expected. Um, is there a reasonable period that they should be expecting to wait before they should start contacting SBA to follow up um, and make sure it's it's still in process? Or do you have any kind of um, advice for them when it comes to communicating with SBA? Well, right now, uh, this morning, we received a message from the Secretary of the Treasury. And in it, he said that in the past 14 days, the SBA has done 14 years worth of lending. So that is absolutely Herculean task, to say the least, to do 14 years worth of lending in, four, in just a two week period. And these are not just run of the mill loans. These are economic disaster loans. These are also the payroll protection loans. So the economic disaster was an, ex an existing loan program, but when they opened the door to allow people to apply, it, it opened it nationally. Usually economic disaster loans are geographically constrained. It's like if a hurricane hits Hampton Roads, only Hampton Roads residents can apply for that, uh, that loan program. But the entire nation got hit with the hurricane, so the entire nation is applying and the infrastructure that the SBA had in place while good for a run-of-the-mill disaster, if you will, just could not handle the onslaught of an entire national disaster. And so they had to take the system down. They had to refigure the way people applied. They cut the application process down from five separate documents that were multiple pages down to a uh, five-page document. And they also allowed for the provision to get possibly get an advance of up to $10,000 based on the number of employees you had, even before the loan was approved. So they have made tremendous strides in that regard. The payroll protection plan is something entirely different. It started out where the, the banks who were authorized were those who were already approved 7A lenders. In other words, they've had significant SBA lending experience but they changed the entire process to allow for the faster processing of these loans. And to be honest, they haven't really gotten all of the steps down yet. And the banks are looking for guidance in certain key areas. Uh, the SBA is still doing research on it. Their legal department is looking at it because there are a variety of rules, regulations, and laws that have to be complied with across the board. That's all well and good to speak in defense of the delays, but when you're on the receiving end, any delay is a deadly delay. And you know they're trying everything they can to get the money out as quickly as humanly possible. 
Speaking of being on the receiving end, um, Jim, you know, uh, Jessica especially has been, uh, the chamber has been tirelessly trying to understand the business landscape currently, talking directly with the businesses. We're getting feedback from businesses, obviously. And we both have been trying to take the very timely and vital information that you've been generating for us many times a day, and plugging that into our website information. We have, we both have, the Chamber and Economic Development have a business resources pages having to do with these loans and, the, and potential future money and also what we're seeing in, in terms of, um, you know, how, how best to apply for and deal with the lenders and so on and so forth. We're also doing bulletins, uh, getting the word out. We've been really appreciative of, of the timeliness of what you've been uh, providing. Uh, so I think one of the things you wanted to, to be helpful with for our businesses was helping kind of see beyond the event horizon of now, the disaster piece, and we're getting into the recovery. And we'll get into that in a little bit here, my, my question is more along the lines of what you just talked about. We're, we're very interested in having a format like this to do some um, myth busting, if you will. And in particular, we're, you know, we're not sure that all of the business community has heard the latest about, for example, the rationing uh, down to $15,000 of, of the loan program. So there are a lot of people who are waiting to hear back still. Uh, they may not know some of the latest. Uh, and wanted to give you an opportunity too to, to talk through this format about myth busting and making sure folks know about that $15,000 and any other fundamentals about the program right now, especially if there's more funding coming from Congress, which we all hope there is to, to stimulate the economy. Absolutely. And there are myths that are out there. And a lot of times uh, people hear what they want to hear. And sometimes between the official announcement from a government, uh, you know, official to the actual implementation, things change along the way as information gets updated and uh, re-reviewed. And so consequently, people have one idea and then they come in and talk to the bank based on their frame of reference and the bank says, oh, no, that has all changed or that was never even around. Uh, there are a couple of things with regards to the uh, limitation on the economic injury disaster loan. It has been limited to $15,000. Uh, it would be $25,000 if you got the $10,000 advance. And this is regardless of what you requested for working capital for your business. Uh, this was done in order to get money out at, to as many businesses as possible. While on one side of the coin, it works. On the other side of the coin, it's like throwing a, you know, instead of throwing a drowning man a string or a rope, you're throwing him a, a rope that's attached to an anchor and they may drown faster because they don't have enough money and they've just brought on another $15,000 debt. And so it's a, it's a double-edged sword and it's an unfortunate situation, but that was due primarily to the fact that once again, nobody really had an understanding of what the financial needs were going to be at the outset. And so what looked like a very huge number, $2.2 trillion is really rather inadequate to cover the entire country and cover the needs of the small, small businesses. And so there is a, a desperate need right now for Congress to appropriate the funding to get these programs up and running. The uh, EIDL loan program, uh, that they've closed the portal. They do not have funding to, uh, they cannot take in any new applications. Uh, they, those that applications that have been received and the people who do have a number from the SBA, they are in queue and they will be reviewed. And just because they're reviewed does not automatically guarantee acceptance. You know, there, are, there is underwriting criteria that has to be met, but they will be reviewed. Nobody will be turned away if you already have your application in place. With regards to the payroll protection plan, uh, that is now out of money. They burned through $350, million, or $350 billion in guarantees, and the banks cannot accept any more applications at this point. So it's a it's a rather messy situation right now. Thank you, Jim. Um, so just kind of um, 
talking about a little bit of myth busting. I'm going to go out of order on my questions just for a second because I think it's relevant. Um, you mentioned the up to $10,000 grant. So of course, um, you know, just from talking with our, our chamber members and other business owners, um, they automatically think that they would get the 10,000. Um, but what I have seen, and of course, um, you know, from all the information that you're pushing out to us is it's, um, it's not you automatically get 10,000, it's 1,000 per employee um, or something of that line. Can you expand on that just a little bit? Absolutely, and this was one of those issues where and initially they thought we would give up to ten thousand dollars and everybody said great getting ten thousand uh, dollars of an advance that would be forgivable and uh, grant is not the word i would use it was if it was part of the loan but it was going to be an advance and if you didn't get the loan it would be forgivable um, when they looked at it in greater detail they said we just can't give ten thousand dollars to everybody what we will do is we'll make it contingent upon the number of jobs that could be saved uh, by, you know, uh, by this, by these funds. And so consequently, they said, for every employee that you have, you will qualify for $1,000 in the advance. So if you have 10 employees, you can get up to $10,000. If you have six employees, it's $6,000. All right, very good. Um, and just, uh, just kind of a quick question that popped into my head um, when we were talking about the $15,000 limit. Um, so those loans that are in process right now um, that have been processed by SBA for the idle loans, um, if they have applied over $15,000 and they're only going to get the 15, does that mean that if more funding becomes available, then their applications will be reconsidered for the for the full amount or is everyone just being capped at this point at 15 and then we'll have to reapply? I don't know if there's if anything's come out on that yet. Does that make sense? Or? It makes makes perfect sense and unfortunately we don't know. Okay. Uh, we're still waiting for guidance from the Treasury and the SBA. Gotcha. Okay, so um, if somebody needs to reapply, then there are probably certain things, um, they may have learned the first time around, what it was that they really needed to have ready and available in terms of data on their businesses, documentation, and so on to make that process smooth. Whether you're talking about the economic injury or the uh, paycheck protection uh, program or whatever else might be coming down the pike, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be that Congress uh, not only stimulates with these these current programs perhaps there's another one coming down the pike and then so folks in the event that they are applying for the first time in particular you're probably seeing and getting feedback about where folks get stuck in the middle of the application process if they had had a certain kind of information or data that might have been smoother for them can you give us a few examples to to help our businesses not hit that sort of barrier midstream in their application process? Absolutely, and the, and the EIDL loan program is an ideal uh, demonstration point. Uh, under the old system, an application consisted of five multi-page forms, and they were fairly detailed and significant and asked for a lot of information. Additionally, the applicant had to inc include uh, their latest business tax returns, uh, as well as give the, IR, or the SBA authorization to draw those tax returns from the IRS. So there was a significant amount of paperwork that had to be uh, generated. People thought that all they had to do was go online and start filling out the form online without having pre-filled out the forms on paper to make sure they had all the right information. And so my recommendation, if you're going for a first time EIDL application, is download the old forms, the five different forms, starting with form 5C and moving on from there, and, or form five or for form 5C, depending on if you're a business or a sole proprietor. And then downloading the application portal uh, and find out what information they're doing and then fill it out in paper first so that you have the information to hand so that when you do go online, you can have it, you have the answers right there in front of you and you don't make yourself very frustrated by having to quit the program, go look at the information, go back into the program, quit the program, 
and get yourself in this painful do loop of uh, you know finding information, entering it, then finding out you didn't enter all the information, and it just gets very very frustrating. Uh, we have at the SBDC we have downloaded those forms, and we have them available. Either we can send them to uh, individuals directly, or we can send them. Excuse me. Sorry about that. Uh, we can send them either directly or we can uh, post them to the Economic Development Department and Chambers websites so that people can download them. And the SBDC is here to help people either by phone, by email, or by Zoom broadcast, Zoom counseling if necessary. I think that would be great if we were able to show those on our website, Jim. So we'll work with you offline on that one. Okay. Jessica, I think, I think you're up if you have one. <laughs> yeah, so um, just kind of, uh, you know, we, we definitely have had a, um, a lot of information coming out on, you know, what to do now if you own a, sm a small business. Um, and the steps that you can take for different funding sources and whatnot. But um, let's touch a little bit on, you know, looking past the disaster response that, um, you know, that we're all seeing now. And, um, you know, I, I know that we have a lot of businesses that are closed right now, and they are contemplating the decision to either reopen or stay closed. So, um, you know, what do you think, Jim, are the most important considerations to help a business owner make the correct call at this time? There's an old adage that goes, when you're up to your butt in alligators, it's hard to remember you just came in to drain the swamp. Uh, and that's exactly what we have right now. You, they were, you're so focused on the immediate needs of your business, the immediate needs of your employees, and the immediate needs of your families, that it is hard to look beyond just solving that because these are all encompassing issues that have to be addressed and they consume a con considerable amount of time and brain bandwidth to make sure you're getting it right because these are the three key things that you have to watch out for as a small business owner. That being said, you have to step back every once in a while and look downstream and find out what's going on in the world around you. What is going to be the governor's decision concerning reopening and bringing Virginia back to uh, business again? what is going to be the new accepted norms for being in close proximity to another person? Is, it going, is everybody going to be practicing, and I do hate the term social distancing because that's an oxymoron, but the fact of the matter is, is that there may be, may be times where you will not be able to interact with your, your customers because of a requirement to maintain a safe distance between individuals or you're going to have to put up a sneeze barrier, or you're going to have to do this or that. And it comes down to whether accepting payments. Uh, are you going to go f completely cashless or are you still going to accept cash? Uh, what about personal protective equipment for your employees? Are they going to have to wear latex gloves? What kind of latex gloves? Are they food handling gloves or hospital grade gloves? Uh, there's just a lot of things you're going to have to take into consideration before you open your business. And two other things you have to look at. First is your customers. Remember, your customers may have lost their jobs. Your customers may be very, very cash strapped at this point. So if you're selling luxury items, you're not gonna be selling too many luxury items. We think the focus is going to be now on the basics. I was reading some studies from the Retail Wire and they're recommending um, retailers stock 65% of their inventory has to be basics. You know, food, shelter, clothing, well, basic food, basic shelter, basic clothing, stuff to survive. 20% should be basic, but nice basics. And then the remainder can be either low end luxury or middle, middle, middle level luxury or something like that. But that's going to be around for some time to come. Uh, we see the, a lot of retail stores, and if you look at the Wall Street Journal today, a large uh, retailer has started the clock for bankruptcy. Uh, 
we figure that the bulk stores, the you know, the, I won't name names, but the large membership stores uh, are going to thrive because they have the ability and they have the supply chain to make that all work. Uh, small retailers really have a, a great way to exploit a niche in the marketplace right now because maybe somebody doesn't want 27 rolls of toilet paper. Maybe they only need one or two, and so they can come to the small retailer. So it's up to the business owner to sit down and look at their customers, look at their customers' needs, find out as much rock solid information as possible, make some assumptions up front, but then go back and visit those assumptions. Uh, last but not least, you have to take a look at your own supply chain. Uh, what are your, who's your suppliers and what are they doing and what is it they can do for you or what is it they cannot do for you because they've been impacted by the uh, disaster as well. So it is an incredibly complex puzzle that small business owners are going to be asked to put together. And when you couple that with going back to taking care of your family, your employees and your business, it just becomes rather overwhelming to say the least. And it's something that has to be addressed. Jim, thank you uh, very much for all your insights this morning. I think what we want to try to do is to cap time on this, knowing we could go on for a very long time, but perhaps catch up with you uh, in a second session next week, if you'd be available to do that. We see things changing so rapidly that uh, we probably ought to be doing this once every two, two or three days, but we'll try to find the right time uh, to, to get back together if that's all right with you. It's been a real pleasure hosting you this morning. Well, thank you very much. And it's great to be able to reach out to uh, the residents of Isle of Wight County and anybody else who is uh, watching this broadcast because, you know, in the kingdom of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. And in this case, knowledge is king. And they've got to have that knowledge in order to work. So thank We're you. Do a, that's right. We're going to do our best to post this um, as a link on our social media, Jessica and I both. And um, so we hope it becomes a good resource this week for folks and try to market it and, and uh, be able to see you and hear what you have to say about, about what's going on right now uh, with respect to response and recovery. So with that, Jessica, any final thoughts before we wrap? I just wanna thank you so much, Jim, um, you know, for everything that uh, you're doing to help the small businesses and, and um, the partners with Small Business Development Center. Um, I have found your daily emails very, um, encouraging and timely and have been trying to um, you know push it out to our businesses and members as quickly as possible and it's all been um, really great information and very valuable so thank you for everything that you are doing um, you know to help us at this time and part oh, no, you're, you're quite welcome and I got to admit I'm just Jim I've got an entire network of people co-workers and my state network that are providing us with information and uh, without that tremendous organization behind me, I couldn't even begin to do my job. So thank you. All right. Thanks. We'll be talking soon. All right, folks. Have a good day out there and take care, please. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye now. So, Coach, how'd I do? <laughs> Hang on a second. <laughs>